And joining me now is Arlen Suderman, the Chief Commodities Economist for StoneX Financial. A little energies conversation here to kick off the morning ahead of the CPI report. And Arlen, looks like we just had some news uh, kind of break across the tape. I'm not sure if you saw, but OPEC uh, adjusting some of their forecasts here. I'll read a, a few of these things, but I just want to get your general thoughts uh, uh, anyhow. But we do have uh, OPEC keeping 2023 oil demand growth forecast steady at 2.4 uh, million barrels per day. They uh, keep their 2024 target for oil demand growth uh, at their forecast of 2.2. Uh, and they did raise uh, their supply for non-OPEC uh, supply to uh, 100,000 barrels uh, per, day, uh, per day to 1.5 million barrels per day for 2023. A little bit of demand uh, and growth adjustments from uh, a tenth of a percent higher for both. So not a huge uh, market moving event, but notable. Literally just came out about two, three minutes ago, so I wanted to read those. But Arlen, uh, sorry about that. Let's get your opening thoughts here. Crude oil, to me, has been the underreported uh, story of the last month. I think it's the most interesting moving uh, market. It has been so counter to everything throughout this year. Uh, what do you make of it? Yeah, earlier this year when I was on your program, I stated that I felt like commodity inflation would see a return at some point, and the lead indicator that I was watching would be the crude oil market. And we had a significant movement. It broke through that 200-day moving average here a couple of weeks ago. That was very significant, and that signals a change in the philosophy of the market. We've been seeing for about the last year as interest rates have been going up, the funds have been pulling their money out of the commodity commodity markets, uh, specifically crude oil, as well as the grain and oil seeds markets, those food-based commodities. And now that money is starting to come back in, especially oil. And it's interesting to know, you, you read the OPEC numbers, they're expecting that sustained demand. They've clearly communicated um, that they have price objectives here, that they want to see us maintain prices. And so they've been cutting production uh, with uh, Saudi Arabia cutting back, Russia cutting back. They want to maintain a high enough price to sustain the war in Russia, to fund Russia, as well as to sustain their own economies. And they're going to do that. And the question is, when we do see that uh, recovery in the economy, uh, how, how quickly are we going to be able to bring that production back online? And that's very difficult here in the United States. We're down on frack crews. We don't have as many frack crews as what we used to have. Um, there isn't the uh, political support for putting money into the fossil fuel industry. It's going to be a lot tougher to get that production ramp back up. And the market, Wall Street's convinced that the U.S. economy is coming back. Uh, this morning, CPI numbers will have a lot to say about that. And it does see that even OPEC starting to become a little bit of a believer in the U.S. economic growth. And uh, this is probably the one thing, and I, I missed it amongst the kind of, uh, you know, breaking news of all the things. They do raise their U.S. economic growth forecast for this year from 1.4 to 1.8. They're still on the negative side. I think we just saw the GDP now somewhere in the four handle. Who knows where it ends up being, probably somewhere between those two numbers. But even OPEC, that's been a little bit more on the pessimistic side, is starting to relent a little bit. What do you make of this recent rally, though, Arlen? It's been so, so, uh, so quick. Uh, July was basically every day to the upside. We went from sub-70 to now pushing 85 a barrel. It really changes the conversation, does it not? You mentioned CPI. That's due in about eight minutes. Uh, this is going to be impacted, at least on the headline front, uh, by this pretty vicious move in, 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 energy, in energy prices. Yeah, and I would say if we do have GDP north of 2%, we're going to have trouble hitting that 2% uh, inflation target. That's going to be a real problem for Jerome Powell and for the Federal Reserve. They're committed to that 2% target. And as a previous guest said, that last move down to 2% is going to be very difficult. They've pinpointed two things as a concern, and that's been wages, which really hits the service sector. And we've not seen any real significant easing of wages to this point. Labor market remains very tight. Uh, and uh, so that's going to be a concern. But commodities are coming back. 
and uh, that's first led by crude oil now. And that's going to be a real concern going forward. I agree with the previous guest that I'll be surprised if uh, we don't see inflation numbers this morning that are north of where the trade is expecting on Wall Street. And it's going to put the Federal Reserve in a real tight situation. And I think we're going to have to see higher for longer in order to get this under control down to the 2% level. I do not see how we can hit that 2% mandate without inflicting some more pain on the economy. And so that's where things, I think, get a little bit complicated then, Arlen, as we start uh, considering the uh, context of what you laid out. And I think our own uh, Oliver Rennick here on, on TD Ameritrade Network uh, believes in a lot of what you're describing as well. It's sort of his general narrative, uh, which it's, it sort of describes a catch-22 situation to me then. It's, uh, you know, we're either strong, but then inflation is going to be an issue still. So we're going to have sort of the headwinds from central banks. We're going to have basically forces trying to put a basically a hold on how strong growth can be. Or we do get inflation under control, but then it's like what was the fallout to get there? So as you look ahead then, you know, what is the scenario where we sort of thread this needle? Or what, I guess, is your sort of base case for the next few months, uh, half of a year, next couple quarters uh, for crude oil and, and maybe uh, just the general trajectory then for the U.S.? Yeah, I think we need to cool the crude oil market and we need to keep the other commodities cheap and we need to start tightening up, excuse me, loosening up the, the labor market. That's going to be the key. And we haven't really done enough yet to loosen the labor market. We've had our hit. The initial uh, interest rate rise has had its hit on the manufacturing sector. Manufacturing sector is essentially in recession, not just here, but many overseas countries as well. But it's the service sector we have to hit next that's very heavily dependent upon labor and that's going to be a problem i do not see how we can do so without inflicting a little bit more pain on the labor sector and our problem is about the four and a half million people who retired because the stock market did so well their 401ks did so well during the pandemic and who removed from uh, from the labor force how do we can't bring them back um, and then we have others who are still missing from the labor force as well. And it's just we can't the Fed doesn't have any tools at this point to add labor supply to the labor force. All they can do is decrease demand for that labor force. And the other thing we haven't talked about here is the Ukraine mm -hmm. war. And the world's gotten used to being able to do with uh, uh, to exist with a lower supply of food commodities coming out of Ukraine. But Russia, that's because Russia is dumping a record amount of wheat on the world market right now. And, of course, a, quite a bit of crude oil as well. The war is escalating and the risks are going higher for Russian cargoes coming out of their ports. If we get to the point where we start curtailing shipments of oil and food grain, I'm going to call it wheat, out of Russia, then that's a game changer that's when we really see inflation in the energy sector and in the food commodity sector, and that's going to definitely have an impact on CPI. And looking at then, uh, you know, if someone's listening at home and they're, and they're following along and they're agreeing with uh, kind of the sentiments that you're laying out, is that something where uh, looking to things like wheat futures is where you'd be able to be actionable, uh, actionable and, and sort of speculating on that, not uh, you know, suggesting that you provide advice or, or, or any type of calls, but uh, is, is that sort of how you would go about it? Do you go straight to the source or is there companies or, or other ways to kind of get exposure uh, to those type of products? Yeah, one of the challenges of trading the wheat market is most of the wheat in the world is traded on the cash market and not the derivatives. So the futures market for wheat tends to trade with the fund manager perceptions of reality. Uh, so maybe some of the uh, ETFs that talk about the grain market uh, that uh, c contain them, uh, some of those uh, com some of those um, uh, relative parts of the market that deal within the grains, that deal within the commodities. Um, Maybe a place to go, some of the commodity indices. Those are the places 
uh, where we would see that opportunity to participate in that. We ha here have a Stonex Commodity Index uh, that tracks the five-year inflation, uh, break-even inflation rate with a 0.91% correlation over the last 10 years. And so as inflation expectations go up, we see money go into the commodities, and that tends to raise the whole basket of commodities uh, versus individual commodities within it, that basket. And then we see an almost a strong correlation between those commodities then and the lagging indicator, which is the CPI. Good stuff. We got to leave it there. We got this report about to break in a little bit over 90 seconds, but really uh, gr good stuff and appreciate the, uh, the insights. Arlen Suderman, Chief Commodities Economist at Stonex Financial, appreciate uh, his insights.